Before we start the forum, we have just a few announcements. Um, just a couple. Um, we have probably have relatively low attendance because Saturday night we blew all of our energy on a giant event at Tracy's house, uh, which was a salon and fundraiser for the mail. And everybody had to cook their, you know, dishes for that. And so I was afraid people wouldn't be like cooking again. I didn't but cook, <laughs> I just went to Gerbs. <laughs> <laughs> I made the same thing I made for the salon. No, um, so uh, we have online washers, so that's good. So we had a successful evening. I don't know if you want to say anything about the fundraising effort. So it looks like that we have raised a little over 2000 but we have a couple of co uh, some commitments that are another 2000 2500 So we're trying to raise $10,000. So I hate to count the, the ones that are say that they're going to give and they're not here yet, but that's, that's, that's just honest. That's where we are. So um, we would like to have a $10,000 fund so they can have a revolving uh, bond fund. So um, there's been a lot of learning in this process for us to figure out how to launch and do it. So uh, some of you we may be talking to again just to get a little more help. So, yeah. Okay, so that's uh, our major effort. Our next meeting, which will be the fourth Wednesday in June, which I forgot is the 27th. <laughs> I forgot to put that down. Andrew Hutchinson will be talking about um, the ballot issues for the August and November elections, and especially Prop A got moved to August. So he's going to talk about that. And then we will also have the Faith Voices, representatives from Faith Voices talk about the border crisis. And that's really important that we, because we're taking a break in July and August, and we wanted to hear about that before we take our break in case they have any ideas about anything that we can do to contribute toward that issue, which seems very intractable at the moment and very upsetting. Um, our first fall meeting after the break will be September 12th, and we will have Brianna Lennon and Taylor Burks, candidates for Boone County Clerk in November, and maybe others. I'm trying to line up the November candidates for that. Um, and um, is there any other announcement that anybody has before we? Uh, oh. Sorry. Attendance. Um, just print your name, um, email, phone number. Do you want candidates to talk to? Or well, or that's to nice if you know, we'll know who's we'll know who's here. Um, I think we're. I think that uh, Peggy, do you want to say anything about our policy brief stuff that we're working on? Also, that's coming. Oh up? yes, uh, that would be another item. Uh, Lynn, Tara, and I and anybody else that we can rope into it are working on a policy group on community-oriented policing. And because we realized that over the past two years, we've presented so much information to city council on that topic. And yet, when we look at um, things that have been presented by the city manager and others, it doesn't reflect all of the resources that we have collected or the analysis that we've done. So we decided, why just wait around for other people to come up with something? We're going to write our own document and present it. And we are working on having that ready by June 30th. And that will be uh, to inform the report that is due at the end of July from uh, Sergeant Fox and the city manager on the implementation of community-oriented policing following a proposition developed, a resolution adopted by council in February. So we're going to take the initiative to be part of that our voice into that arena rather than just speaking to council and it being kind of ephemeral that, you know, it's in the minutes, but this will be something that we can uh, contribute that's very concrete. 
Um, any other announcements? And we have that uh, yellow sheet, our talking points for the bail bond fund. Yes, we have a, uh, and I did send it to all the, okay. the guests, but okay. we do have, for those of you who weren't at the salon, we had this yellow um, talking points document. You can take, we have had some left. I made too many. So um, you, if you know somebody who might be interested, that's uh, basically the argument for the uh, bail fund that we're raising on for and how to contribute. And uh, that was created to inform the press because they kept, they kind of start from square one. You know, they ask us, why are you doing the bail fund? You know, they go back to step one. <laughs> and we wanted to have something, again, that we could give them, inform them, and as resources so that uh, they don't keep asking us to recreate the, the story over and over again. I think that's it. Anything else? I think that's it. Well, it's time to introduce uh, our candidates. We might have some people trickle in still because we told them we would start the forum at 6.30. Um, but I also told the candidates we'd start at 6.30, so we'll <laughs> we, we will do that. And we will end at 7.50 because we have to devote our last 10 minutes to group discussion. Um, whatever is just the topic of the evening. So um, we have this evening five candidates. I thought we might even have six, but we have five. Um, we have David Seaman, and you want to raise your hand. He is running for Boone County Presiding Commissioner. And his opponent in the primary, the Democratic primary, will be Dan Atwill, who is the Incumbent presiding commissioner. Um, after numerous efforts to um, contact him and get him to come, um, he wasn't able to. Do so uh, the winner of that primary will face Matt Cavanaugh. Then we have, well, um, Steph, uh, Kevin O'Brien first. I'll just go around in order, and Stephanie Morrell. Moral. Moral. Okay. I'm trying to make it French. <laughs> um, associate Judge from Vision 11, they are also both running as Democrats, although for judge candidates, party isn't. We have, they run at under parties, but they aren't supposed to say they're kind of affiliated with parties. They're different. Um, and the winner uh, in that race will run against Josh Devine in the fall. And then we have Tracy Gonzalez and Steve Wilson. And they are running for associate judge of Division 9. Again, they're both Democrats. There is not a primary um, for the Republicans. And the winner of their race will not even have opponent in the fall because it's too late now I think to file for that so this is kind of it unless some giant write-in effort <laughs> <laughs> comes forward so um, then we also have Finley Gibbs who's with us and we will have him back in the fall He'll be running for um, Circuit Court Judge Division 1, 13th Circuit. And um, I don't know if you want to um, say anything about the difference between the um, divisions and circuit. Like well, I mean, basically, the, there's actually a, a small difference for um, the issue we're going to be talking about today setting bonds and setting uh, types of bonds and that most of the time the associate circuit judges are going to be front line on that and that the circuit judges handle the case if it's a felony after it's already cycled through associate circuit court or through a grand jury so you know hopefully you need but the circuit court judge in division one would be handling some of those issues but most of them would have been settled by the time it gets to circuit court but it's still an interesting area. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so
So, and we thought we have, might have Jamie Blair. Um, she's running for state representative in Missouri 43rd, but maybe she couldn't make it down. She's going to come. Northern Missouri. Um, and uh, before we start, I want to make a note that candidates for judge, and four of these candidates are running for judge positions, are constrained by professional rules from campaigning in a traditional sense, which we have had candidates at our forums who attack each other, for instance, <laughs> or they, until we say, don't do that, we're here to discuss issues, but. Um, we won't say any names. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, well, we've got to know now. That, doesn't, that does not happen with judge candidates, um, at least in public. I <laughs> and they may, sorry about that silly comment, they may speak to their qualifications and experience, and if you look on their websites or Facebook sites, that's what they address. Their qualifications, their experience, they all say, I'll be good for this position. Um, but they cannot comment on issues or cases that might come before the court. They also can't make any promises that if something does come before the court, that they would rule in a particular way because they're constrained in that way ethically and professionally. Um, does that kind of cover? Yes. 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 Okay. A good synopsis. Yes. And then in terms of the bail fund, I think we, we do have questions about that, but if you feel that's outside of the parameters of that um, those rules you can let us know, but we, we hope you, since you do have a major role in that, or would have a major role in that issue. And some of you have already had a major role in that issue as prosecutors or, or attorneys. Yeah, but we won't ask you any, any campaign oriented um, questions, and I think for a lot of people, your ability to keep refining how the process works. Um, where um, advocacy can fit in neatly to help people understand how they can get involved and make change. And so um, as lay people, we don't always understand that. We know that there's an issue, but we don't know where those openings are for engagement. And I know from sitting on the outside, it looks scary to have these people down there all the time raising hell, but that's what we do. And so, um, but so it's good to get direction. It's good to always help us kind of refine and understand on where there are bottlenecks or where there's where there are places as a community where we can do a better job of policy. And that's not about taking a position, it's really like ideas, like this is what I see, these are the problems that we face, this is how it works, these are some of my suggestions for how things can be better. I think that's really important because a lot of times we talk about problems, but we really want to hear what people are thinking inside their head and how they work with their colleagues to solve problems. So I think that's really, really important. Yeah. We also have the document that um, uh, Judge Ox and Handler headed up the, um, the working group report. And um, we do know that court reform, bail reform, all kinds of issues are in the air. So um, we, we know that you're in the midst of that and may have ideas about that. Um, so, but before we uh, start, each of you has two minutes each. Would somebody agree to be our timer for that? Just give them a, a wave or something when the two minutes is up. Just an opening statement to introduce yourself, what you're running, why you're running, and then we'll launch into our questions. Mr. Seaman, you want to start us off? Yeah. Uh, my name is David Seaman. I am a Rockbridge and Columbia College graduate. I uh, graduated from Rockbridge in 07, graduated oh. from Columbia College in 2012. If I do the math, I am 29 years old. Um, <laughs> right on being young. <laughs> um, right after I graduated from Columbia College, I joined the Marine Corps as a logistics officer. I spent the last uh, five years doing that. Uh, I was honorably discharged last January. It's been a whole year since so I've been out. Um, why? I was a senior in high school. Uh, my father passed away from cancer. And a few months later, uh, my then girlfriend, now wife, told me that she was pregnant. 
So I went through my senior high school becoming a teenage parent while going through the tragedy of losing my own father. Um, and we survived because of people right here in this community. Um, never heard a bad word, never ran anyone who ever had anything negative to say. Um, I'm obviously a young black man, my wife is, is white. So it was very it was very interesting to live in Missouri, coming from South Carolina where I'm from, to have that experience. So when I got out of the Marine Corps, we decided to come back to the to give something back. And I'd like to bring the experiences that I've had in these 29, almost long years of this life. Um, I was five years in the Marine Corps as a logistics officer back to fair for the people of Lincoln County. Thank you. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. I was uh, watching on my second one. My name's Kevin O'Brien. I live in Columbia with my wife and our four kids. Um, I've been a practicing attorney here for about the last 20 years. I was a public defender here in Boone County from 2001 to 2009. Five of those years I was district defender at the local trial uh, public defender's office. Since 2009 I've been in private practice. I've been with a firm and I've been a solo practitioner. Um, I'm running for judge because I think we need more of a defense perspective on the bench in Boone County, and I also think that we need private practitioners who've been in the business of being attorneys and representing individuals to step up and, and inject their experience into the judiciary here in Boone County. I think the experience of a private practice attorney is very different than a prosecutor or a public defender. Uh, private practice experience can bring a lot of value and a lot of efficiencies to the court. But sometimes you don't get that because you know it's difficult to take a break from your practice and your business essentially and get yourself into public service. So those are some of the reasons that I've decided to run um, and some of my experience. And thank you very much for inviting me. My name is Stephanie Morrill. Uh, I'm an assistant prosecutor here in Boone County. Uh, I'm a courtroom attorney for almost 20 years. I am a single mom raising two boys here in Columbia. Um, sometimes life runs curveballs, and you find out that you have to work a lot harder than you thought just so that your kids can have the same opportunities as everyone else. I have appeared in front of the Missouri Supreme Court over a dozen times. Many attorneys go their entire careers without ever making it to the Missouri Supreme Court. I've worked for the Attorney General's Office here in Missouri. I also have worked for the public defender system. Uh, in Kansas, and I have worked for legal services. My entire career has been dedicated to community and public service, and I believe that my life experiences and my legal experiences make me the right person for Associate Circuit Judge Division 11. My boys and I left Columbia. Um, I told an individual a little bit ago that uh, I moved here back in 2000 and thought I would do my two-year commitment with the Attorney General's office, and then I would move back. Uh, closer with my family, and we fell in love with Boone County. And my kids inspire me every day to make this community better and to make it safer. Um, we need judges who are dedicated to what's fair, what's right, what's equitable, and I believe that I'm the right person for that position. So thank you very much. My name is Tracy Gonzalez, and I'm running for Associate Circuit Judge Division 9. I have been a practicing attorney for over 30 years. My entire career has also been in the area of public service and community involvement. Um, I started my career uh, in the public defender's office in St. Louis City as a public defender for over five years. Um, I was one of the first public defenders that was asked to be part of the capital litigation division in St. Louis, um, meaning I represented individuals charged with the uh, murder of the first degree where the state was seeking the death penalty. That was a wonderful foundation for me in terms of my legal career. Um, I've been, I'm now the first assistant prosecuting attorney here in Boone County. Um, I've been a prosecutor off and on for 15 years. The majority of my practice has been in the area of child abuse and neglect, um, as well as violent felonies and homicide cases. Um, I've also been the director of the Child Protection Clinic uh, that was at the law for four and a half years, where we, um, my job there was to seek permanent placement for children who are in foster care. Um, and I did that, like I said, for four and a half years. Um, I have had the opportunity to work in family court, juvenile court, 
civil court um, and probate with all of the work that I've done with the juvenile um, child abuse cases. Um, my husband and I have been here for almost 25 years. We are the proud parent of one son um, who is getting ready to enter his senior year. Um, we have loved Boone County. I have served Boone County uh, since coming here for 25 years ago. And I believe that my experience in all of those areas, the foundation that I have working for defendants, working for families and children, um, and people of this community would make me the right person for the position of Associate Circuit Judge Division 9. Yes, my name is Steve Wilson. Uh, I am an attorney in private practice here in Columbia. I've been an attorney for almost 15 years, and the entirety of that career has been spent in private practice. Uh, the first four years of my career, I was a general practice attorney, meaning I handled personal injury cases, workers' compensation cases. I did business work for large companies. Uh, I also did criminal defense work. Um, and probably in that, at that time, about half of my practice was related to criminal defense. Um, the last 10 years of my career has been devoted entirely to criminal defense work um, in private practice. So the entirety of my career is involved in representing individuals charged with crimes um, all over Central Missouri and even areas outside of Central Missouri. I practiced during my career in uh, nearly 70 of the 114 counties in the state of Missouri. Um, I've appeared in front of at least a couple of hundred different judges. Um, I've appeared in and represented clients in two of the three appellate courts and have appeared in the Supreme Court of Missouri as well. Uh, and representing clients in different types of cases. Uh, my wife and I live here in Columbia with our four kids. My oldest daughter actually lives in an apartment now because she's a, just finished her sophomore year at the University of Missouri. Uh, but my three boys um, are home with my wife. Two of them are in Columbia Public Schools and the other one will start uh, Columbia Public Schools about a year from now. My daughter graduated also from Battle High School uh, in 2016. Um, I believe that my experiences as an attorney in private practice um, and the wide range of experience that I've had representing people all over the state, individuals in all kinds of different cases, uh, make me the best candidate uh, and make me the appropriate candidate for circuit, uh, Associate Circuit Judge Division. Thank you. Okay, um, we're going to let Finley introduce himself. Oh, he did. Oh, I mean, uh, okay, so I just need Jamie. Jamie. Jamie, do you want to come over and just introduce yourself? You can stand, you can come a little closer to me. Okay. Yeah, just introduce yourself. All right, I'm Jamie Blair. Um, I'm running for State House of Representatives in the 43rd District, um, which is not in Columbia, and it doesn't have any part of Columbia, but I think it's important that I come up here and I ask for everybody's support here in Columbia as well, because unless we get some more progressive values out in the rural area, it doesn't do a lot of good to um, elect people from the places where we do get progressive. So, um, People like me and Dr. Rumble, Jeanette Bell Jones, are trying to bring those progressive values to the rural areas because we think that they, they already exist there. People just don't know that they have a choice, um, a way to express their voice um, and get the, the kind of progressive things that we need. Um, and racial disparity and economic disparity, um, it isn't less in rural areas, it's more. Um, there's more of it, um, and it can be a lot more um, institutionalized. Um, and accepted out there. So um, candidates like us were out there for every day working to change the paradigm and shift things back away from the red side of things a little more towards the blue side of things. Um, so um, I have been living in Missouri um, since I was about 11 years old. I've been living in the Mexico area for about 15 years where I've been raising my three kids. Um, and I want to focus most of my energy, um, at least during this campaign, on access to rural health health care, so Medicaid expansion for starters. Um, I'd like to move toward a single payer system eventually, but we gotta get we gotta start somewhere. So um, Medicaid expansion is obviously the very first step. Um, we need to focus a little bit more on um, education funding um, because Missouri has one of the lowest um, state levels of funding. Um, in the country, uh, so that puts so much of the onus for funding on local communities, which means it ends up segregating our schools by economics, and that's a system we need to move away from. Um, in addition to those things, I would also like to focus on rural infrastructure um, with an emphasis on rural broadband, because I can really leave a lot of people behind without that high speed access. You can't turn in homework, you can't access higher education, and those kinds of things. So um, I'm asking for all your support, um, and I appreciate your time. Thank 
Thank you, Jamie. That was great. We um, will have you back in the, the fall when we get to the November okay. election. This is for the primary this yeah. month, like I explained to you. So, but um, I'm glad you're here. Also, if you want to say briefly something, so we can move on to our primary candidates. So can I just interrupt for two seconds? Uh, nothing bad. I just want to take those chairs. Can someone help pull yeah, those? Pull the the, no, no, no. The chairs that are on the inside, put them on the outside, so that when people come in and have a seat, there's another chair right here. Uh, can, we, can, we, yeah, can we grab this chair? Um, that way people won't will see chairs to sit in and they won't try to walk in front of you like talking. <laughs> 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 All right, Are you ready? Hi everybody, um, I'm Arendelle Jones and like Jamie Blair, I'm also running for Missouri State House of Representatives. My district is just west of Jamie's, so it's northeast Boone County and a little bit of southern Randolph County, so that's northeast Columbia, um, Serge Sturgeon, Clark, Centralia, and Paulsville. And so um, I'm just briefly going to pick back kind of what Jamie said, uh, because we stand for very similar values. Um, that we want to bring uh, equity, we want to bring social justice, racial justice to central Missouri um, because it's definitely lacking. Um, one project I've had picked up very recently is with the uh, community policing uh, policies and the meetings that they've been having, the attendance is sorely lacking and the uh, amount of effort that the city is putting forth to make these, these meetings known to the public is, is minimal at best. And so uh, I kind of took it upon myself because the third ward where I live in, in District 44, um, is one of the most affected communities uh, by these policies that they have. And so what I've been doing within the last week is I put a Facebook ad out because when the city of Columbia put out a Facebook ad, well, they didn't even put out an ad. They, they kind of very last minute put an event out. I think like two people are interested. Um, and so I put one out and then there's, there's, there's coming up on over 50 people. Um, yesterday and today, uh, we passed out about 150 flyers um, in the third ward, mostly along Rice Road and some of the, the, the roads that are around there. I used to live on Rice Road way back in the day. No politicians ever darkened my door and that's certainly never happened probably before today. So uh, that's, that's very important because all citizens need to have a voice. Um, regardless of whether they're big name donors or they're just people who live in, in, in trailer parks or Section 8 housing, um, it, it doesn't matter. All citizens need to have a voice. And so when I was going around knocking on doors, uh, especially yesterday, um, out of the dozens of people I've talked to, um, maybe one person, one person was aware of the community placing on, on that road. So this guy just goes to show you that we need to have more of an effort by the city and, and granted as a state rep that's not directly my provision but it's it's the right thing to do i mean it's it's really as simple as that so that's what i've been up to lately so thank you right, thank you by the way thank you for doing that outreach um mm -hmm. and it's an example of modeling the kind of outreach mm -hmm. that needs to be done to reach communities um, i think that uh, folks forget that not everyone has internet access and so you got to kind of go back to the old ways, which is like knocking on the door. I don't want to say horse and buggy, but I'm kind of thinking that. <laughs> uh, but no, just that more personal touch uh, of getting in touch with people where they're at. And uh, we need a lot more of that. I think that will build a lot more relationships in our community. But thank you very much. So, Peggy? Okay, back to our uh, primary candidates. And the, this fall, let's have a great big or maybe more than one mm -hmm. um, forum for a November yes. election so we can hear more. Um, we made up some generic questions because we knew we had Mr. Siemens kind of in a di slightly different position um, than the judges. So um, I hope this will work. But first, and you somewhat already um, addressed this, but. Could each of you talk about your top three priorities for the position you're seeking and in in the way that you feel is appropriate to talk about that? Sure. Want to start with David? Yeah, we'll just go around that we'll way. We'll just go around. And you're going to give him a time limit, Peggy, each time? Yes. Uh, we have five questions, and then we'll have one minute uh, closing statements. So. At this point, I wasn't sure what time we would, uh, we have um, 50 minutes left, mm -hmm. is that correct? So um, 
Oh gosh, time is getting short already. <coughs> so um, try to spend about um, two minutes talking about your top priorities. <laughs> And if you if you don't need your two minutes, that's fine. Yeah, if you don't need all of it. Yeah. Uh, well, my, my top three priorities. Uh, the first one is uh, bringing back the fairgrounds. Uh, I think that is a vital institution in this community. I think we can make it to where uh, it's not just a small number of people who are enjoying it, but it can be a place where the entire community can come together. Um, that would be priority number one. Uh, priority number two is uh, going into our tax incentive programs, tax payment programs, and trying to reorient them to focus on quality jobs instead of quantities of jobs. Um, the average county worker in this in this county uh, makes thirty-seven thousand dollars a year, and when we give companies tax abatements, we only ask them to maintain that that wage. So the county government can't affect the minimum wage, but you can't affect that wage by asking companies to, instead of bringing in 100 jobs at $37,000 a year, bring in 75 jobs at $40,000 a year, bring in 50 jobs at $43,000 a year, start raising that wage, start ensuring that companies are not just providing a decent wage, but they are actually hiring people within the county and not just importing them out of state when they their business here. Make sure that you are offering health care when, uh, when they bring these jobs. The third priority is making uh, county government more accessible, um, more transparent. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm a, a quote-unquote millennial. I will tell you now that county government here does not have it doesn't have any kind of social media presence. And when folks my age are looking for something to do in the county, that's where we're going to go. We're not going to a website that, to be quite honest, it's like it was built on Windows 95. So. <laughs> We need to update that. We need to. <laughs> 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 I'm going to so, use that. <laughs> um, county commission meetings are held at 9.30 on Tuesdays and at 1.30 on Thursdays. I was asked at a forum uh, if Bill's going to tell me those meetings I've gone to. The answer is zero. Just because I am an hourly employee, I can pass the door to people in this community. And unless I'm going to take a precious day off, which I prefer to use when my daughter is sick, or my son has something that needs to be done at school, I can't attend those meetings. Which means there is an artificial barrier that's been placed there in front of me from being able to interact with the government. Thank you. I think, um, as a judicial candidate, I mean, it's, it's difficult to have priorities um, that you dictate to the entire bench, but I would say that probably the three most important qualities that a judicial candidate would have are ensuring that the people who come before you have faith that you're putting their best interests at heart. And they have faith that you're being fair and that you're interpreting the law correctly and that you are going to render sentences that fit with their circumstances individually. Uh, too many times I've seen judges really get, just get stuck into bracketing where they don't really consider individuals, they don't consider the individual crimes or the individual circumstances and they will, you know, render sentences that are that seem unreasonable. They will render sentences that are, you know, very heavy-handed, and that's really not, in my mind, the appropriate use of your judicial power. I mean, you have tremendous discretion as a judge. I would like to see a judiciary that was more in touch with the individuals who are coming into the courthouse who need their services, whether they be juvenile offenders, whether they be, you know, people, married couples getting a divorce, whether they be families who are dealing with probate issues or, or young offenders, you know, in criminal court. And that's what you get when you're an associate circuit judge. You're dealing with people who oftentimes are coming into the courthouse for the very first time. So I think probably the first priority would be to create a courtroom that is friendlier to the people who come there and need your services. And is that goes to great efforts to reach out and make sure that people feel comfortable, that they understand what the process is, and, it, and is compassionate to their individual circumstances. The second priority would be to work on addressing this bond situation. Boone County has a terrible problem with jail overcrowding. It's very expensive. It is, uh, 
an issue that uh, has been around for years. I've been to countless meetings on how to correct the problem. And it's something that I think can be addressed. And I'll, I'll give you an example. I practice extensively in federal court. And in federal court, if you're not a danger to society, and you're not a danger to the community, you don't necessarily have to post a bond. It's not a dollars and cents transaction. It's just a, a judgment on what your prior criminal history is, what your offense is, do, does the judge overseeing your case feel that you'll come and show up? Um, and, and we could implement some of those practices here in Boone County very effectively. And I think it would do a great deal to help us with our jail expenses. It would do a great deal to help um, our justice system process things more efficiently. Because one thing that happens with people who are in jail is that they feel tremendously pressured to plead guilty. They're afraid to stand for their, up for their rights. Um, it's a tool that works against them. That's why people have a right to a fair and reasonable bond. So I think that's a very important thing that the judiciary needs to take seriously. And then secondly, I would say we need to make our courts more efficient. In Boone, and some people here may not know that. Oh, sorry about that. Let's um, we'll, let's give you guys a system so that um, we don't cut you off in mid sentence. I'm sorry about that. That's we'll make a point to give you a, a ten and a five. Uh, we'll do our best because you know I might have whatever problem, but we'll try to give you a, a heads up. But we'll come back to you. Again. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, there are three. I don't know that we call them priorities, but things that I think face Boone County uh, and that I would face as a judge. One that I think that we are working on really well and continue to work on in Boone County, and that has to do, again, with our, our jail overcrowding. Boone, as many of you may know, that uh, the bond system and what we do in uh, Missouri is being addressed by the state legislature. The Missouri Supreme Court is also part of that. So to the extent um, that they are addressing it, I, I won't comment as to that. But I will comment as to what we do in Boone County, and I think um, we have a program called Adult Court Services that once an individual is arrested and uh, is incarcerated, they have not made bond, um, Adult Court Services comes in and does an investigation. Do they have a home plan? What is their prior history? Um, is electronic monitoring available? Can they, um, would that be acceptable? Um, is what we call an ROR or a home recognizance, is that appropriate? And, Adult Court Services works very closely with the prosecutor and the judges to move this in a timely fashion. And I think that is something that we can continue to work on in Boone County um, and something that I would be very interested in, I think, as a priority. Second is our alternative sentencing courts. Uh, many people consider those drug courts. Uh, Boone County, the 13th Circuit, is very involved in alternative sentencing courts, which are alternatives to incarceration to give individuals treatment, counseling, job opportunities, job training. And I think um, being able to identify those individuals more quickly is something that Boone County can continue to do and as a judge, I would continue to do. Third would be efficiency. And here I'm not just talking about um, criminal dockets, I'm also talking about civil dockets. Court is during the day. The more times an individual has to come back, um, the more that's interrupting their life. And so if we can continue to work on the efficiency of our courts, so that people can get back to work uh, and get back to their lives. I think that's very important. Some of this may be a, a little bit um, expanding on what's already been said. With regard to the bail sit and bond situation, um, I was going to talk a little bit about adult court services and we might do that. I think a lot of you uh, as part of this group are also aware of um, the Criminal Justice Administration meetings that take place once a month in Boone County. I mentioned Judge Oxenhandler, he was instrumental in getting this group together. And that's, um, as a first assistant prosecuting attorney, go to those monthly. And all of the key um, stakeholders in the criminal justice system, prosecutor, judges, uh, public defenders, sheriff's department, CPD, private bar, uh, probation and parole, they all sit around the table. And the discussions that we had deal primarily with making sure that we can keep the jail at a uh, number that is all people and what we have talked about has been how do we deal with individuals and bonds. Um, I think that's a discussion that has got to continue. Um, if uh, elected as judge, my role in that would continue in terms of being a part of that group. 
uh, having a dialogue that might be a little bit different in terms of what we might be able to do might change if given that opportunity. But it is something, and I think I've been in a couple of meetings where some of the members of your organization mm -hmm. have been there. Mm -hmm. And I think that every month is a productive type of meeting, but we do talk about those numbers. We have continued with Judge Oxenhammer's uh, desire to see those things change. Um, the other thing that I want to talk about also with regard to equality um, in our justice system is the alternative sentencing courts. Um, those are open to all people. And one of the great things about an alternative sentencing court is it knows no bounds of race, it knows no economic bounds. Um, anyone who is eligible is suffering from a mental disease, uh, illness, has a substance abuse. Though that is a process that's available to those offenders. It doesn't matter what race you are, what economic background you come from. And those have got to be continued to be utilized, and I would do that. Um, dealing with families as I do, it would be nice to see, and it's not a criminal process, it would be more in the juvenile process and family court, a family law uh, court, where individuals who are looking at losing their children, not because of criminal activity, but for other reasons, have substance abuse, um, have some type of mental health issues, can be treated, um, and also efficiency. Um, we all, as practitioners, see that, that those uh, cases can languish both in the civil court and in the criminal court, and we need to do what we can to make that move more quickly. And there are three of the main things I would want to address uh, if I were to be the associate circuit judge for Division 9. One of them is uh, the bond issue that you guys have addressed with the flyers and the information you had in from your meetings last this past weekend. Um, the court system here with alternative uh, with adult court services, um, like Stephanie said, um, has the ability to do reviews of cases uh, to determine whether someone might be eligible for different types of release besides having to come up with the money to post a cash bond or to post a 10% bond with a bail bond. Um, to have the av availability of a judge to have the options to release someone on their own cognizance, to have them check in with adult court services, um, to have the ability to put them on home monitoring if there's a case where you feel like needs more monitoring than uh, simply letting someone out and having them check in once a week. But having those things available to the courts um, through both court services and through the county court system, I think are important because it gives a judge more options than just simply setting an amount of a bond or deciding to release someone. If you think that a particular case requires more supervision, you can have the availability of someone maybe coming to check in once a week or call in and check in with court services. And I think simply having those things available um, and expanding access to those are important uh, way to address the bond issues so that a judge always has that availability of those different alternatives uh, when someone is maybe sitting in jail and having been arrested on a charge. Um, the second thing I would like to talk about are expanding access to uh, the alternative sentencing courts. Um, I had recently a client who I knew needed to get into uh, a treatment program. He was a veteran and he needed to go into veterans court, but because his case was a misdemeanor, uh, he was not eligible to participate in veterans court. And two weeks after he was denied placement, he was arrested again for a felony case. So now he is eligible. And had he been eligible in a misdemeanor circumstance, um, he could have gotten into, that, into treatment court and gotten in and started earlier. So I'm trying to expand access where it's available. Um, and finally, um, having the ability, uh, well, so, so I'm sorry. Um, I don't recall, but sorry. Okay. Well, that's okay. Well, you come back around if it comes to you. Uh, yeah, I think you did a uh, very efficient job because you actually, in many ways, addressed our second question was, um, how would you see yourself advocating for policy changes that would bring these priorities about? And if we could do a really quick lightning round, is there anything more you'd want to say about how you would do what you want to do? And I would like to make a caveat before we start that. You know, the last time we had the candidates forum, we, we set up a rubric that our, we wanted to hear answers that addressed to equity. So I'm glad that all of you addressed equity without us prompting you. Yeah. Um, I'm going to push a little bit more on the responses that when I, when I hear efficiency, that's, that's, this is just my lens reacting as a person of color. Um, I, it sets off radar for me. 
uh, what I mean is, is that how can we talk about how people are impacted? Some of you did talk about it, all of you have, but uh, how can you, in your capacities, get your culture to start being more people-centered? Um, we can have grand ideas, but I think when you're making policy and stuff, if you, if you read that municipal uh, work group document, it's pretty bad. And it's all about discretion, right? If there's every, it's, the, system, it says the system's fine, the discretion's not working. The discretion's not working. That's what I read, right? That all these people have discretion and they're using their discretion the wrong way. I don't know, maybe I have it wrong. But anyway, something to think about when we say efficiency, we're humans. And being uh, this thing, I think sometimes we get twisted in this thing about efficiency. I want it to be more about how do we practice taking care of people. That's just me. So. And if I can take a second, I do recall okay. the last thing. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was from the, it was because it was from this afternoon. And I was in Portland location. It's a public defender wait list. Um, the current three yes. yes. So I I sat through a docket today in Division Nine, waiting to announce that the defendant had passed away, um, who was on the public defender wait list. But I listened to a docket that had over 100 cases on it, be called alphabetically with all these individuals being called in every five or six weeks. Um, taking off work and multiple people addressed to the judge. I, you know, I can't keep coming in. Some cases from last fall, August, September, October, uh, where people have been coming in every five or six weeks since last fall, waiting for an attorney to be appointed to represent them. Um, and although, as a judge, you can't address the funding issues with the public defender's office and figure out ways to have more public defenders in place, you can possibly figure out ways to make that docket in particular more efficient if there has to be a wait list figuring out ways so that people who are on that list aren't coming in every five or six weeks over the course of eight or nine months um, while they're simply waiting for their case to get started. So looking at ways to make that particular process more efficient um, is one of the other things that I would want to address. Now, I like efficiency on that, and but we don't talk about how people's lives are in interrupted quite enough. I mean, right. people that are, are being harmed by this are already fairly marginalized as it is. And their lives are really hanging on the edge. And so I don't know how do we get, maybe part of our problem is that we talk about inefficiency and we miss like the human you know, component of it. But again, that's my, this is how I see the world. So that's why I'm saying that. Sure. And I, I, you know, my experience in the times I've set through that docket um, and in the times I've ended up representing individuals pro bono who were on that docket. Right. Previously Thank you for doing that, dockets, by the way. You know, I, trying to figure out ways, because in most of those circumstances, those individuals are either not employed or they're employed at very low wage jobs. Right. Um, and missing missing those jobs to go to work, whatever income you do have may be gone, because if you yeah. have to miss every month. Because they, don't, have, they don't get sick days and stuff like you, that. You, yeah. may not, you may not have yeah. a job anymore. So, right. um, and then you're right, you know, they're even in a worse spot than they are waiting, you know, facing a felony or a misdemeanor carry jail time. Uh, so trying to address those ways to, and I don't know exactly what the answer is, but it's something I was thinking about today, is finding out a way to uh, make it so maybe those individuals don't have to come in. If they're on a wait list, if they don't have an attorney yet, that those people could be excused from appearing so they don't have to come in. So that the time they come in is once an attorney has been assigned to them and their case is actually going to start moving. Yeah, so that's it's crazy that they're coming in and they have no attorney and they're just showing up for like no reason. And I mean, it's the crazy. announcement, the reason it stood out to me is because Judge Bradley, who's a Division 9 judge, that is retiring at the end of the year. One of the individuals that came up, he announced that he had bonded out August, I think it was August 7th of 2017. So uh, he, had, he was out of jail and waiting on a felony case, although the bond was low enough to be able to still qualify for public defender services, but had been waiting, is still waiting from August of last year for a judge, and I think the public defender wait list is close to 500 people. Right so now. we had a discussion amongst ourselves about what the minimum maximum is to get public defender representation. Can you tell us what that what that is? I don't know the exact amount. I just like it. Yeah. Is it it's a sliding scale based on your on your income? Okay. How many people are in your family? And your assets. Yeah, your assets. Okay. okay. So it's not a it's not a okay. So we were just kind of looking at the the seven hundred list and kind of figuring this is what the average kind of a bail looks like. I've um, seen terms. circumstances where an individual owns a vehicle. So that's considered an asset, an asset that they might be able to sell to pay for a private attorney. So they're denied access to the public defender um, where they may have to appeal, um, you know, to, 
very subjective, but anyway, but, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, and the numbers are, when you look at what it costs to hire in most circumstances a private attorney, I, I think, you know, the, the amount of money that, that where the, the line is set for access to public defender is probably too low. But yeah. you also have the issue where if you raise that number, the wait list problem is even bigger. Okay, that was a good example of taking something and expanding on it. I want to give everybody else that opportunity if there was an issue that you presented in the first round that you would like to say more about how to make that change, what you would actually do with it. Um, please take that opportunity to expand. Well, I think uh, Tracy brought up the efficiency. Um, and when I brought up efficiency, the efficiency is, is the human touch. You have individuals who are having to come back to court, whether you're talking about criminal court or civil court, um, every, approximately every 30 days to, every, to two months, um, and you are continually interrupting their lives. So is there a way that we can lower our dockets, be able to resolve cases, Certainly, there's always going to be cases that can't be resolved in a timely manner, but you have to consider what impact you are having on this individual's life by making them pump um, every 30 days, every 60 days. So Steve brought up um, the public defender wait list, and that is really an issue um, in Boone County. Our public defenders work very hard in Boone County, um, as they do throughout the state. So it certainly is not any comment on our public defender attorneys. We have some of the best public defender attorneys in the state. Um, but we have to be able to find a way to not be impacting um, these individuals that are charged with crimes as much as we are. So as a judge, is there a way to um, have them appear less often, not necessarily have them in a courtroom? Is there a place they can check in, like adult court services? So we know there's they're still around, they're still trying. We have a lot of individuals, like uh, Steve said, that um, come in and say, I'm supposed to be at work today, like, I'm gonna lose my job, and that's never, you know, we just don't want that, um, that bigger impact. So being able to find ways to be efficient for the individuals that are having to appear in court. Just to piggyback on some of that, I think as a judge, it is extremely important that um, we have two, rules that we have to go by. One, we have got to follow the law, whatever that law is. We have to uphold the federal and the state constitutions, and that means recognizing the rights of individuals who are charged with, with crimes. Um, and there's a lot that goes into that. Um, we also have got to be able to figure and consider the individual facts and circumstances that are before us. So who are these people? What are their circumstances that have brought them before the court? And in terms of efficiency, when we're talking about this public defender crisis, and having been a public defender myself for over five years, this is not a new phenomenon. We have always run into this issue where we are inundated with cases, and we just don't have the time to do what needs to be done to effectively represent. So one of the things that we're talking about now more often in this jail overcrowding is the public defender crisis. Because at the same time, we are interrupting people's lives. We are asking them to come to court on um, every 30 to 45 days. Uh, they're missing work or, or missing employment opportunities. Uh, so that is a negative impact. And on the other side, the criminal case is languishing. Um, but if we give the public defender more cases, are their rights being infringed upon? So this is, if you ask for solutions, we are around that table with all of those stakeholders trying to figure out what is going to be the best alternative. How are we going to address each of the, because there's 500 people on that wait list. Those are 500 individuals. They're not just a group of people. Each person has their own individual uh, circumstances that are brought them before the court. Are those being addressed? What about those people who have substance abuse issues or have mental health issues? Those are going unaddressed in ways that they wouldn't have to be economically impacted. There's drug court, there's mental health court. So this is a, a when we talk about it being a crisis, it's a community crisis. And um, as a, if elected as a judge, I would continue to attend those meetings. And again, we have to keep having this dialogue. But again, we can talk all we want. 
there is no the solution at this point, and if elected, one of the things that I'm going to do is work with the other judges to come up with, is that can be resolved overnight, to come up with some movement so that people are getting their rights um, addressed and, and honored um, without the rights of the Thank you very much. I think it's important that the group knows that judges, you know, one function of judges is to actually implement rules and policies that effectuate the running of the courthouse. And at the Boone County Courthouse, you know, recently, we've seen policies change where people can't bring their phones into the courthouse, they're cut off from, you know, friends, family, uh, you know, they spend hours sitting around while, you know, the jail brings people over, people are on video, um, all of these things are going on while people just sit in these pews and their cases aren't adjudicated, even for very, you know, for very rudimentary things. You know, routinely, lawyers will go in and they have a very, very, very quick process, a very, you know, you know, rudimentary thing. They just need to think, continue to another hearing. And their clients will end up sitting around for hours waiting for that to get done while, you know, jail, jail populations are brought in. And I'm not saying that's not important, but we need to come up as a judiciary with better protocols and better ways to run our courthouse that are better for the people of Boone County. We can be more efficient. We can implement these policies. We have the power to do that. One of the reasons I think that the people are up here running for judge is because they want to have the ability to actually effectuate these changes because they're not being done in, a, in the correct manner in their opinions, I would assume. And, and that's, you know, what I mean when I say we need a courthouse where people can feel comfortable, where they can come and feel comfortable doing the business that they need to do. They need to be able to be trusted to have a phone in this day and age so they can call rides, so they can call their employers, so they can contact their attorneys. You know, these are decisions that the judiciary makes with no input from outsiders. They sit around this table that we've talked about multiple times, and they do things that affect everybody who comes into that courthouse every day with no input. You know, I think, you know, as a judge, we need more input from the people who are basically consumers of the legal services that we provide. And we can do that. It's not a problem. It simply means opening the door and inviting people in to have that dialogue. Um, I do have to say, um, I do uh, genealogy research, and so I go to a lot of courthouses. And uh, I'm really pleased that when I go to our quarter, I, I look, they're super, super nice. The courthouse, it's a little iffy, but um, the recorder and those guys. But um, I have been to courthouses where I'm not allowed to take my laptop um, in to do research. Um, I've seen people go into court and they can't call people on the phone and there's been a change and they can't call people and it stresses them all out and it causes all this confusion and it's really awful. Um, even the docket on the outside of the court, sometimes it's wrong and things are not right and then there's all this pandemonium out in the hallway and you can't call anybody, you don't know what's going on and yeah, people are missing work and so I don't know, I just think it's a... It's, it's a, a dehumanizing process. It's a very, it's a very de even to watch, even for me when I've watched, um, I, I'm very affected by it. Uh, it's very depressing to me. So. Yeah, some of us have done um, court observation and uh, I've had that same experience. You feel like uh, when the first time you do that and are told you can't bring your phone in, you feel like, oh, I did something wrong, you know, what's going to happen to me? You know, and that's silly. So. Um, I've, had, I've had experiences with clients who can't drive because their license is suspended and they're dropped off at the courthouse, they have their phone and they're gonna have, their ride's gonna come back and pick them up, but they have nothing to do with their phone. They end up, if they can't find me to put their phone, their phone in my bag so I can take it in, they end up hiding in the bushes. I mean, I've had clients hide their phone in the bushes while they're in there for four or five hours. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a traumatic situation. Yeah. It's not been handled appropriately in my mind. Well, I'm glad that you bring that up because those are those are not the kinds of things we talk about. And actually, what happens when people of color talk about those things, people say, "No, no, no, that's not true." So I'm really happy when white people say it <laughs> because when people of color bring these up, you know, they're told, "Oh, that, 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 that's that's crazy. That 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 can't be happening." And we hear it all the time. So I'm I'm really glad to have a, 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 a white man come. You know, you you I mean, you obviously know that when white people say things. It, it has a lot more bearing than when people of color say it. That's unfortunate, 
but it's a, it's, a, it's a truth of the matter, and so we need more of that, so I appreciate that. Mr. Seaman, I don't want to leave you out. You no, said I, that I, you I, had three, uh, and I, well, I, I think that the commissioners do interact with the court and the jail and some of these other systems, but of the priorities you expressed, is there anything more you wanted to say about how you get them done? How would you get the fairgrounds moved, or do you want to continue on the equity um, discussion? I, I like this discussion. Okay. I think they all hit the, the nail on the head there. It's, it's being, as Tracy said, in the room at that table to be able to make those decisions. I mean, I think this is a leadership failure, to be honest. When you have people at the table making decisions who don't have those experiences, um, case in point, I was pulled over two weeks ago for having for not having uh, a front license plate. Um, and I asked the officer, you know, he comes up, he asks to see my license for registration. I asked him what the problem was. He, he complimented me on keeping my hands at 10 and 12. And I wanted to say, well, it's, it's kind of obvious why that's happening. <laughs> um, so well, I do think having thank people, you for thank you for noticing. Like, so right. I do think having people at that table, with just being able to speak to those experiences, it causes a dramatic change in the way people think. And the county commission doesn't have direct control over a lot of these issues. But those people who do are in those meetings with the county commissioners. Yeah. And when you're sitting across the table from somebody, it's a lot harder to ignore their experiences than when they are showing up to a meeting and you sit for five minutes and they walk out the door and you look for you with them. So I don't know what our next question is, but I, I want well, we're, I was going to move I, I on to the racial equity. Sorry. The county commissioners do attend that meeting, some of them. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, this, those those criminal charges are open to the public, but so nobody knows what happened unless somebody tells you. And they're at weird, and, and they're not at times. And they're at, during the, in the morning. Is it seven? Yeah, seven morning. Yeah, they're not okay. conducive to, like, Public, which, which goes to your point about meetings and things like that. And so um, I want to just throw this out there again, because we talked about it, but just sort of the dehumanizing things that happen and, we, and when we interact with public officials and the way that they speak to people and how they talk to them, that's like a really huge um, issue for me. Um, uh, I was uh, profiled a couple weeks ago. I don't know why I think there's a burglary and the officer thought somehow or another a lady driving a gold minivan with her Yorkie in the front seat had somehow just recently robbed the bank. <laughs> and uh, and then I got pulled over another time with my son because we went to dinner and he forgot to turn on the lights. Turns out he had a traffic warrant. They called another officer <coughs> to another car to throw him up against the car and roughhouse him. And then the woman officer grabbed me because I'm standing up watching and I'm like, you need to take your hand off me over and over again. This is some bullshit that's going on. Doesn't happen to white people. Now, if my white husband would have been with me, I guarantee you, no one would have grabbed me. No one would have touched me. He's white. So, I mean, w even though people don't grab you at the courthouse, they talk to you like they're grabbing you, right? And people don't have any trust, and that's horrible. That's part of the reason people don't show up to things. Meetings are not where they can come. People don't know how to talk to them. People are very judgmental. We haven't talked about bias. So I bring up to humanization, think about how do we work on this system, which you're, all these reports say that bias, implicit bias, racism, whatever you want to call it, um, is very prevalent, like a disease in this system. So I would like. And that's really the theme of our group. So I want to shift, um, you know, our topic to, to bounce off what Tracy just said. Um, and we had three questions on that, but I'm gonna, just going to look at all three of them and see what you each have to say about this. Um, that is, how do you explain the racial inequities in the system in which you're going to work, or the organization, or the geographical area, or whatever you um, call it, um, and what changes you think are needed in the institution you will serve, if elected, to address those racial inequities? And how would someone in your position play a part in that? Um, you've already touched on that, but we want to get 
specifically to the issue of racial inequity. Did you want to comment on that for me? Sorry, what? Hold hey, on, I'll, I'll come to you. I don't want to take anybody else's time. Well, I see. Well, you, you haven't said anything, so okay. I wanted to say well, if you wanted. I'll say one thing that's beneficial to everybody here. Uh, first off is that, you know, I've been practicing for 21 years and, and I've been in many courtrooms around here. I don't think that any of the folks here are likely to uh, perpetuate one of the biggest problems that I've seen out there, which is the concept that uh, people who are appearing in court are lesser than, and, and that's not so much a racial issue, but it does play that way, are lesser than uh, somebody might see on the street. And we've all seen judges, and we're not naming any names at all, we've all seen judges who are impatient. And they're, especially in the associate circuit, where your dockets are so huge. And by that I mean, you know, there are you know, 150 people in, in the room waiting for their chance to be in court. And the judges forget that each person's case is the most important case that exists for that person. And so we have to maintain an atmosphere, of, you know, a, a solemn atmosphere in court because that's part of what it is. But I think, and I think that this generation will do a much better job, um, and hopefully my generation, if I'm so lucky, but uh, in communicating with the average person. Everybody's terrified who's in there, they've been dehumanized by losing their cell phone, which I'm also completely against. But, uh, and then to sit in front of some judge who stares at them and uh, isn't, doesn't grant them the humanity of taking that extra second or two to get themselves settled in front of the bench or whatever the problem is that that person's experiencing. So, you know, I think that we can uh, I, again, I'll say this generation of potential judges can make that gap where we can treat everybody with respect and still be strong and still maintain the dignity of the courtroom. But that's something I felt all over the state. And it's few and far between the judges who can be polite and explain what's going on without, without uh, uh, acting as that person's attorney, of course, which is a big issue. That's, that's where the problem is. A lot of judges say, well, I, I'm not your lawyer. I can't tell you what's happening. Well, yeah, you can. I mean, you can't tell them what to do, but you can explain what they should be doing within reason. Um, and I just, I, I just think there needs to be much more communication and a much um, more approachable atmosphere, but while still maintaining dignity. Yeah, and I don't think and that when, we, when we say the word the word race or the word racial equity, people think we're saying you might be a racist. You know, um, it, we're not talking about necessarily some intentional thing. We're talking about systemic um, issues that kind of infuse the entire organization and the entire system. And those of us who have observed in the courts see the um, the imbalance, for instance, when they bring the incarcerated people in and they're in shackles and they're in those striped outfits and they look like something from the past, whereas the people who have been able to bail themselves out are sitting in the audience next to me in their street clothes. So there is a lot of um, symbolism there. There's a lot of um, things that are happening that nobody's going to say I'm doing this intentionally, but it's happening. So what part do you think you would play in dismantling some of that? I think that some of what you're talking about may be issue related that we can't get into a lot of detail in terms of um, what our positions are, just because we have to remain neutral. Um, I would say, it, that one of the things I think is very important is respect. And if you've been inside our courtrooms now, you know we've become completely electronic. So the judge is now sitting up on the bench with three screens <coughs> trying to figure out what's going on. Um, and like Finley said, every single person who comes before the bench is an individual. And I know I keep saying that, but that is so critical that as a judge, you recognize the individual that is before you recognize their facts, their circumstances, who they are as a person. And 
what that means as a judge. And it might seem like a small thing, but I think it means a lot. We've been taught since we were young. When you're talking to someone, you look them in the eye. That is respect. You're hearing them. They know you're paying attention. And I think as a judge, you've got to look over that screen and make eye contact with every individual that comes before you. Make sure you're seeing that person. Not the person who is necessarily, this is a criminal in, in handcuffs. Um, and I am a prosecutor, so but I've also been a defense attorney, and I've represented families. So I've seen all of it. Every single person who comes before a judge, whether you are the incarcerated, you bonded out, you're in the middle of a divorce, you're losing your children to foster care. Every single person has a story, every single person has a life that they've come from that is brought from there. And you have to take the time to see that person. Those dockets are huge. The associate dockets are very, very large. It's not that you're going to spend 10 minutes with each individual, but you have to let them know that they've heard. Um, and I think that goes a long way. Uh, is there anything you'd like to say, uh, any of you, about the racial aspect of this, well, of the dockets and the courtroom no. scenes that we see? Well, to the extent we can answer that based on um, our ethical rules. This is my position. Um, part of it is looking at the individual, but part of it is, is that when I'm considering a case, if I was a judge, you have people who come in and say, um, this punishment would be appropriate or probation would be appropriate because I have a job, I'm going to college. And those may be appropriate considerations, but the, on the other side, so is the consideration that this individual has never had an opportunity, that this individual deserves that first chance. That, and that's not necessarily going to race. I grew up in a family where neither of my parents had gone to college. Um, they went to school when I was growing up. There were seven of us. I worked, had to work very hard for every opportunity I had. Um, and to get through college and to get through law school and to get where I am. So that being said, it's, it is that individual. And as judges, we can t only take it case by case, individual by individual. And it's, it's not the race of the person that's in front of you. It's all the facts and circumstances. And I think as a judge, as a human being, one of the first things we have to do when you're talking about implicit bias is be cognizant of yourself and your thoughts every single time. And so that in the position that we will be in, to at least two of them, um, that is the first thing that I think we have to do um, is be cognizant of ourselves. So you're saying race is not a factor? In, I, I, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't getting, I wasn't understanding the working hard thing and all that and race. I, I'm, so I'm trying to figure out what, what you're saying. Okay. So when an individual, regardless of, of their race, appears in front of you, you have to be aware of your implicit bias. Because like Peggy said a little bit ago, we all have implicit bias. You have to consider each individual case and each individual person, opportunities, history, all of that. Um, and my, the, the working hard was simply stating that we all have had different experiences in life um, to get to where we are. Well, my point is that the data shows that there's a racial disparity that's huge everywhere. So I, I think it's great for us to aspire that. I get nervous when people start saying that I worked hard and uh, it just, it, it, it just, uh, it rings it, 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 it's like saying, well, other people didn't work hard. Yeah. But I did hear you say that people have different experiences. I think it's really tricky language, right? That I worked hard and I got here and I don't know. It, 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 it's my, it's my work. I'm a person of color. When people say that to me, bells go off. Because I've worked hella hard, but I bet, pretty, pretty sure, a lot of the things i faced, you've never faced. And I think that's absolutely and so, true. And so the question is that race is an issue in our system because of all these disparities. How do we, how do we deconstruct that in the system? And it's not about people working hard. Because all those poor people in your system, they're working their ass off. 
Yeah. Right? They're working their ass off. Well, I, you know, I think we need to realize that it's appalling in our county that black people are four times as likely to be stopped at a traffic stop than white people. Yeah. I mean, it's appalling, and we need to get up as judges and say that every day. And I yep. think we can without jeopardizing our, you know, our nonpartisan perspective. Uh, you know, this happens every day, and those traffic stops are the beginning of a cycle that yes. take people down. Yes. When you get those traffic stops, it leads to the loss of license, it leads to criminal records, it can lead to incarceration, it leads to all sorts of things that knock people down and keep them down and keep them from getting up. And as judges, we need to be aware of that and we need to be appalled by that. It doesn't mean that we need to, you know, gerrymander facts in legal cases, but it needs to be a, a guiding principle that we conduct ourselves by on a daily basis. And we need to remind ourselves of that on a daily basis because as long as I've been in Boone County since 2001, Year after year after year, you see these statistics. Go up. So, so I mean, you see these types worse. of. They get, they get worse. So, it, so yeah, exactly. It's not getting better. It's getting worse. And yet, and we pay a lot of lip service to this, but it doesn't seem like we're we're putting our money where our mouth is as far as it being one of the guiding principles that we dispense justice with. I'm not sure if Mr. Wilson, if you want to chime in on this particular topic and then Mr. Seaman, and then we'll open sure. it up to any final questions. So I, I think, like, I would say clearly, if you look at just the numbers and the way traffic stops are conducted and arrests are conducted, uh, black individuals especially are arrested at a drastically higher rate than white individuals, despite the fact that the population numbers are reversed. Um, yeah, they're a very small yeah, percentage of the entire yeah, population. That, and that's what I mean. That, so that's, you have this multitude of more times likely to be stopped or arrested, despite the fact that the actual population is is you know is such a smaller number. Um, and and those cases start there when they arrive in the court. So for a judge, if that case has arrived in, in your court uh, where an individual has been stopped, I think one of the most important things. So we start with some of the issues we talked about earlier, bonds and. You know, were they cited? Were they just ticketed and released? Have they been arrested for another offense after they were stopped and then the car was searched? I mean, right. you know, did this turn into a traffic stop that turned into a felony? Right. Was this a traffic stop that became a misdemeanor? Was this a traffic stop that was just simply a traffic ticket? But in the court's position, if you have individuals affected by these things, the, the tools that you have before you through what we talked about are the adult court services and some of those things, making sure that an individual, if they are sitting in jail or if they are charged with crime, that they are being treated fairly when they're in court each and every time. Um, and one of the things that Finley addressed with the large dockets, and, and one of the things I've seen because I have been in front of so many different judges over a, you know, a good part of the state, is if you sit through a docket that has 100 or 150 cases on it, you will maybe see a judge who is happy and polite when the docket starts at 9 o'clock in the morning, and by 11 or 11.30 in the morning or noon or 2 or 3 in the afternoon, they're not so happy. And sometimes they can be not so polite. And we're fortunate in Boone County that I don't see much of that. Um, but to, to address that, and as some of the others said up here, as each individual comes before you, whether they're the first person on a docket to appear in front of you or whether they're the 125th person to appear in the docket in front of you, it's the first appearance for them, whether you've seen 100, client, 100 people come before you or not, it's the first time they've stood in front of you. And so to treat them with dignity and respect, and I think as Tracy said, look them in the eye and, and try to understand their circumstances. And if a question is before you, whether it's an issue of bail or bonds or, or how you're gonna continue or move their case around, uh, you know, looking at each individual case, treating those people with courtesy um, and with dignity and respect, and being sure that every person feels that. Because, you know, as a judge, and I see this as a defense attorney, but as a judge, a lot of times people are going to leave the courtroom not happy with the result of their case. You know, in a lot of cases, half the parties are going to leave that way. A lot of times cases are resolved with plea agreements and you don't have that. But if you have a person leaving, even if they don't like the decision you made, they should feel that you made that decision based on their individual case and the facts of their case and their circumstances and the law that, as it applies to that and that there were not any implicit biases, that you didn't make a decision because of who they are, um, you know, 
you made a decision because of their circumstance and their case and that they were treated fairly every single time for every single person. Okay. Yes. Mr. Seaman. Oh, I'm sorry, I was going to say that, that that's, that's why uh, judge campaigns are so important because I mean, you're hearing here that knife edge issue of how do you deal with a system that currently exists where we have too many stops. But of course the judges don't create that part of things. And so how do- They're does, siblings of each other. Well, they're siblings, I guess. Uh, cousins maybe, but the, the, the judges have an opportunity to uh, communicate that issue to law enforcement, the prosecuting attorney's office. It can be something so simple as don't bring me any more of these cases. The, this particular type of case that you brought me today was inappropriate. I don't want to see them again. And, you know, it, it can be something that simple, but really what I think, and what I was trying to say, and what I think everybody else here is trying to say too, is that you've got to start at a level that's face to face. You got to start at a level that that seems minimal. You know, and it seems not so much concerned about somebody's race, which seems you know in opposition to answering the question. But I, I think that by beginning at that level and extrapolating that out, so that each level of the system starts to stop seeing color. Um, but I want people to see me for who I am but not bring their bias about who they think I am because of my color. I don't well, want people I, mean I, I don't want people I don't want people to be colorblind. I want people to be able to look at black people and say, "You are as human as I am. That we are all human." And I think that that is a big problem. You can respect somebody. I respect a lot of I don't know how to say this right. I know people who are close to me who are white who do not respect black people. I'm still cordial to them. Right? But in the legal system, you have power that these other folks don't, right? So your, your bias carries with it power, whether you acknowledge it or not. Um, and that- anybody's free of bias. Well, no one's free of bias, but we have, a, we have a racial inequity problem in our system where race is at play. And you can be nice to someone but you can also still carry those biases that hurt people. So you can be respectful, but still be helping a system oppress people. Which is by far a greater issue than the typical person on the street who behaves inappropriately to your face. Right, so it's not individual, it's a, it's a <coughs> collectivist right. issue. It's an institutionalized yeah. thing. It's a, it's a position, it's a role with with power. Which it gets back to that, you know, my first statement there, which is you have to be so careful about who you vote in. And it's so hard because judges can't sit there and say, I supported this group or I supported that group or my position well, is this. No, and we and we're yeah, not we're, we're, we're not, we're, not at, we're, we're we're not we're not asking for that. But it's really powerful to have a conversation where we're talking about other human beings. Rather than people saying, oh, you know what? I can't talk about how I feel about the way other human beings are treated because it's too political. Well, it is fucking political. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Surviving is political. Yeah, right? this is, this, I used to be president of the League of Women Voters and I've been to a lot of forums and this is by far of the judge forums. Of course, this is a primary one. Uh, usually we have the, for the general election. This is by far the most candid. Um, would you agree? Because <laughs> usually it's kind of, well, who am I right? Yeah. So, um, but I wanna, wanna, don't wanna leave you out, Mr. Seaman, any last word you have about how you would, your role would try to dismantle um, the racial inequities in Boone County that, you know, the commissioner might be able to um, ameliorate or address. All right, so I, I do want to kind of continue <clears throat> for a second with this conversation, just addressing, even before we make it into the courtroom in front of a judge, I think that we need a new philosophy in policing overall before we get there. Get an argument from me on that. Um, <laughs> it is, I mean, we have to look at who are we stopping, who are we pulling over, who are we interacting with. 
streets with and why. Um, I shouldn't have to put a Marine Corps decal in the back of my car to use this camouflage, just essentially. So what that the when the police officer stops me, he sees that first and instantly has some level of respect before he walks to the front of my car and sees I'm a black man. That should not have to happen. Um, I shouldn't be pulled over for the simple traffic violation. Some traffic violations, let's not be too crazy. But civil traffic violations, what we're talking about, the city of Columbia will soon ask us to provide more officers. Are we providing more officers because we need to conduct more traffic stops, or do we need more officers because we have a different philosophy in community policing than those officers on the ground? I think that's a change there. One of the things that we do as a commissioner, and they are directly over the HR, and one of the better HR policies that have come out in the past 20 years has surprisingly come from the NFL in the form of the Rooney Rule. And the Rooney Rule simply states that when a head coach or a GM leaves a team, and a team has to interview a qualified minority candidate along with any other candidate they would like. It simply puts people who are qualified in that room to, sh to showcase their skills and their abilities and their experience. Um, and they've seen great success with it. It's been implemented in places like Pittsburgh, Oregon and a host of uh, Fortune 500 companies. I would like to see that policy implemented in HR at, at the county level so that we now have some diversity amongst the workforce where people are once again forced to interact with each other because that's really how you begin to change the biases, interact with one another. We are out of time. What is your um idea about um, wrapping up? I'm, I'm for it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, for, I'm for wrapping up. Um, okay. uh, any, we have a, does anybody sitting in the audience um, have a comment or a question that can be question? quick and burn, uh-huh, Renee? I just wanted to, to say I appreciate you <coughs> for the that's uh, a word that is, is most people don't even know the difference. So, <laughs> so I, I appreciate hearing that word in the terms. Yes. Anyone else? Carol? No, I'm not saying that. <laughs> we Are thank you, you sure? very much. <laughs> you're we, positive. You're positive, Carol? Uh -huh. okay. okay. We thank you all very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.